what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Steve, it's great to uh, talk with you after we've had a lot of DMs back and forth over the past few months. Welcome to the Learning Leader Show. Yeah, I'm excited to finally get on the show. <laughs> so uh, to start, I love actually thinking about love. And you dedicate your most recent book, well, which is called Do Hard Things, an awesome book, by the way. But you dedicate it to a couple people. Um, first, your wife, Hillary. And uh, I want to... Uh, put a pause on Hillary for just a second. And I want to focus on Tom Abbey. I don't know Tom Abbey, but it sounds like Tom is a special person. Can you share uh, why you dedicated the book to Tom? Hey, you know, that I'm glad you've asked this because I, no one's asked this yet. Um, so Tom was essentially a teammate of mine while I was in grad school and training as a track and field athlete. Uh, his wife was on our kind of little small team of, of people still going at it after college. And, and Tom was a big part of that. And as Tom transitioned um, from an athlete, he actually, you know, went in and, you know, owned a gym and started strength training and started guiding our strength training. And he was a really good friend. But what I always remember is during that transition piece, our coach, our mutual coach said, Hey, Tom's going to handle all the strength training. Now. And Tom and I were about the same age. And I go in there and I'm like, all right, Tom, like, what are we going to do? And he gives me this long spiel. And if I'm honest, I kind of blew him off because I was young. He was young in my head. I'm like, ah, some of that sounds, uh, I don't know about that. Right. And I listened, I was polite, but I kind of blew him off. And then how Tom handled that, like really made an impact on, on my life because he noticed it and he just paused and he said, Steve, I want to thank you for your critique because I was going back and forth with him and say, I don't know about this. He said, I don't agree with everything you said, but this has really pushed me to think about things. You know, let's let me give some time to think about it, research, and let's have this conversation again. And that really, as a young athlete who went into coaching, that humility really kind of shaped how I approach coaching. And unfortunately, you know, sadly, Tom passed away in his early 30s um, due to a brain tumor. He has two two young children and, and married to the teammate of, of mine as well. And, you know, he was just such a, a bright light. And that story as again, it's something I think about, you know, maybe once every month because it really shapes the foundation of my coaching. Hmm. Where do you think he, he was able to get, I, I know as a younger, immature athlete, I had none of that. Uh, I think I've developed some of that as I've gotten more mature so I'm always fascinated when I see a younger person earlier in their career who has that humility, who has that open-mindedness, which I think usually comes from more experience, right? As you talk to more people, the world becomes more gray. Hopefully you become more nuanced. You become more reasonable. I've, I think I've, because of the, the, the past seven years of doing this show, that's definitely happened to me right? Less like one side versus the other side, much more kind of thinking things through independent thinker. And so when an, a person earlier in their life has that, I wonder how, w where do you think he got that? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I wish, I wish I had the answer to it. I think, yeah. you know, really to me, what I saw in Tom was he was able to put his, he was a very good athlete, um, but he was able to put his ego aside. And you saw this again, as an athlete, he was very strong, but he kind of, his wife was a better athlete. You know, she was like an Olympic trials qualifier and really good. 
Always and, a smart move, by the way. <laughs> yes. So he he put his own like career and aspirations kind of to the side and said, you know what, I'm going to help and support you. So he would, you know, he went from like training to he was at the track helping coach her and support her in his free time as well. And I think, you know, I don't know, but I think that kind of putting your ego aside, like yeah. having the humility, like putting other people before you know, wherever that came from, from him, it was, it was very obvious and it rubbed off on, on, um, the rest of us around him. I think one of the things that's, that helps with that is mentors. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to tease the fact that we're going to talk about mentors, but not right now. Cause there's another part that I really want to get to, um, because I think mentorship is very important, but, uh, I was recently watching a speech that you gave, uh, on YouTube and you're talking about, a, um, a person you were coaching who was a runner. And I believe the time that you guys commenced your coaching relationship, he was 120th in the country uh, in his event. And one of the quotes that re I really identify with because I th feel like this gets messed up so much is when talking about the best. And the quote is, the best aren't concerned with being the best. They're concerned with being the best at getting better. And we happen to be recording this, Steve, the day of the NFL draft. And so I'm watching and reading a bunch of these quotes of these draft hopefuls, especially some of the quarterbacks. That's the position I played. I remember draft day somehow thinking maybe a team will draft me, even though there was almost no chance of that happening. And But I'm reading some of these quotes and, and – um, the quarterbacks are saying like, well, my goal is to be the greatest quarterback of all time. I'm going to be the best ever. And again, when I was 22, 23, I would have said the exact same thing. So I completely get it. But it's so misguided and it's so wrong because the best don't seem to think like that. Can you share more about your relationship with this runner who was focused on being the best at getting better versus comparing himself to all the other runners. Yeah, I think this is such an important point and something that is missed at the, the you know, at the performance elite level. Uh, with this athlete, um, his name was Brian. And what I noticed is coming again, again, he wasn't super highly recruited. He was a good runner, but he wasn't great. He wasn't anyone, anyone expected to compete for a, you know, at the national level, for example. But slowly over his career, he just kept getting better. And he just kept doing the, the things that he needed to do. And he wasn't concerned of, oh, I'm, you know, I'm now 60th in the nation. I'm now 40th. I'm now 30th. It didn't matter to him. What I always saw with him is he just kept coming back to the work. And in the conversations we'd have, it wouldn't be about how do be, I become the national champion he would sit down and he'd ask, Here, here's how this race went. How do I improve upon it? How do I get better at it? What were the things that I did wrong that I could maybe shore up? How do I fix these weaknesses? I remember having a conversation with him once where he said, you know what? I think my speed is, is a weakness. I think it's holding me back. And I said, okay, you're, you know, you're probably right. So let's work on it. And I said, you know what? But when we work on it, we might get a little worse at first because we're going to neglect these things because he was a distance runner, right? He needed to do the endurance stuff and all that. That's how you get good. The speed helps a little bit, but he knew it was going to be a roadblock in his future progression years down the line. So we focused on something that, that didn't get him faster next week or next month. It was going to allow him to get faster two, three years down the line, because then it wouldn't be this kind of limiting factor. And I'm reminded of, uh, I had a conversation with, with Tom House, who is a phenomenal uh, pitching coach, throwing, throwing coach, works with, you know, Nolan Ryan and se several, you know, Tom Brady and all these, these wonderful athletes. And he told me, the best are almost obsessed with the process. 
They're not obsessed with the outcome. They're obsessed with the process. What do I need to do to get better? And I think that's such a subtle but important distinction and one that is missed by so many because they get so caught up in like, oh, I need to have the confidence. I need to like project that I'm going to be the best quarterback in history. It's like, that's not how you get there. You get there by doing the work. And you've got to be almost obsessed with doing the work to, to survive over the long haul. I, I think you almost have to be in love with the work because it's too hard. It's too hard to uh, – honestly, Steve, I when I look at my calendar before every day, and I see that, you know, I've prepared a lot for this conversation. And when I see this morning that and last night and this morning that this was happening, I was just so happy and so like, ah, oh, this is my favorite thing to do to speak with a really thoughtful, great storyteller, intentional, well researched, great dude who I know I'm going to learn from and then others will too. To me, like when it comes to work, there's nothing better. And all of the work that leads up to that, there's so much love involved with the process of reading your book. That's boring. I'm sitting here by myself for hours on end reading a book and then watching YouTube videos and then writing notes and forming an outline. All of that, though, honestly, dude, I love it. And I don't think it's possible to sustain excellence over time whether it's as a quarterback, as a leader, whatever it is, if you don't have a love for the grind of the work, without that, the outcomes just don't come. And with it, I feel like, as Bill Walsh might say, the score will take care of itself. That's what seems to happen. I, I think you're spot on. And I'm, I love that you use this distinction because I said obsessed. But obsessed can go the wrong way and be out of like fear yeah. in the sense that, oh, I'm just doing this because I don't want to lose my job or I'm afraid I'm not good enough or whatever I have you. Love is, all, is a close cousin to obsession, but you're doing it because it like brings that joy to you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, th I think it's such a, and, and I think the other part is, is love is also, love doesn't mean that every single moment of, of what you do is enjoyable, right. right? It means that the whole process is, it's just like being in a relationship or a marriage. When you're in love, it's not that every moment is golden. It's that you know you have this, like, this other person and this security and this other person to share and grow with. And I think it's the same with the work, you know, is similar to you. I love having these conversations why? Because it allows us to dive deep and explore difficult topics and wrestle with things, yep. you know, at a level um, that often in society and the world we don't get to because we like to stay on kind of like the superficial, you know, side. So I'm with you. I, th I think love is the perfect descriptor. One of the other aspects of this that uh, Brian, the guy you were coaching, seemed to have that I found to be a superpower when it comes to high performance is delayed gratification. This ability, in his case, to say, we're going to get worse first. Then a year from now, two years from now, I'll be better. We'll be better. Can you talk more about the, some of the science and research behind why delayed gratification is so important for high performance? Yeah, I, I think this is one of the most important things you can teach and understand, especially in our current world, because we want things now. We want to put in the work and then get the reward right away. But what the science and research and everything says is essentially, you know, progress takes time. There are no, or are, there are very few overnight successes. It's the 10 year overnight success, right? Where we had to put in the work and then it looks like we magically came through, but no one saw the work that we did for 10 years to get to that point. And I think this is why it's so important is if you can foster that mindset of delayed gratification that, you know, hey, over the long haul, 
this is going to pay off. Over the long haul, I'm going to get better. You're setting yourself and, and those you work with um, up for success. And if you look at the research as well, is that the way I kind of compare it is it's almost like lighter fluid versus coals, right? Lighter fluid, you spray it on the grill and you get a big flame and it looks great. Coals don't look so, so great, right? They're just slow burning, but coals last a really freaking long time. Lighter fluid, you need some other source to kind of mix in there to keep things going. That's how I kind of see this motivation, right? If we, if the delayed gratification is, is that like internal motivation that, that is like coals, it's steady over the long haul. It keeps us going so that we can last and do some great things. That's what we need to, um, you know, need to cultivate. And as again, if you look at the research, what it tends to show is those who make it to the highest level have that kind of delayed gratification, that intrinsic motivation, that ability to say, hey, it's okay, I'm going to put in the work and it might not pay off for a while, but eventually it will. Let's talk about toughness. Uh, specifically, the difference between real and fake toughness. Now, fake toughness, as you write, is easy to identify. It's Bobby Knight losing control, throwing tantrums in the name of, quote, discipline. It's the appearance of power without substance behind it. This book, Do Hard Things, uh, talks a lot about real and fake toughness, and I love it. Um, can you share more about the difference between fake tough guys? I'm using guys here, fake tough guys and real toughness. Yeah, you know, this is something, this is at the at the heart of this book because what I noticed, and this goes beyond sports, but I'm a sports guy, so I love talking about it in this context. But what I, I start to see is that we hold up these images of almost this external bravado and like this this outer confidence and this discipline coming from demandingness and authoritarian control and power and we wrap that up into hey this is what it means to be tough and this really came to heart actually when a couple of years ago i was reading you know some some news article and some politician says you know hey He's tough. He's strong and tough. And I'm like, who are they talking about? Well, they were talking about an authoritarian dictator of another country. And not to get into politics, but that really, whether we're in sport, whether in politics, whether in leadership, whether in, we're in parenting, we often hold up this, this external image of toughness when the reality is those who you know, need to have this like false bravado and this, you know, external displays and of strength and power and show you that they're in control. They're actually, they're often doing that out of insecurity. Right. It's no different than the schoolyard bully, right? Who, yeah, they act tough, but they're really insecure and they just really want some friends and want to be liked. And that's why they're, they're, they're bullying. Like they aren't secure in their self. And that's where I think the difference between the fake and the real kind is because real toughness to me is when, when push comes to shove, when you're in the midst of something stressful or chaotic, you're able to navigate and work through it. And the way to navigate and work through it isn't to, to kind of, you know, oh, I've, I'm going to fake my way through it. I'm going to force my way through it. Science and elite performers tell us it's, it's navigating is about slowing the world down. It's about having a calm conversation with yourself so that you can thoughtfully choose the wise action and not just choose the reactive, you know, uh, idea or action. And you see this in, in people we hold up to be toughness or tough, like the military special forces, for example. They're brilliant at this. 
And it's not because they're like, oh, I'm going to just push my way through it. If you look at, again, the research and you talk to some of these, I'm lucky to have a, a couple of former athletes who went into the military. They'll tell you it's keeping your mind steady and calm and clear while the world around you is just chaotic and crazy. And you don't keep your mind steady and clear by just putting your head down and gritting through and pushing through. You keep your mind steady by acceptance, right? Of being like, hey, this is really difficult. Of talking your way through it. Of understanding that, you know, the chaos is, is crazy, but it's okay. And I think that's the key distinction when we look at doing hard things. I uh, was reading... Um, when he wrote, researchers out of Eastern Washington set out to explore the relationship between leadership style and the development of toughness. After conducting research on nearly 200 basketball players and their coaches, they concluded, quote, the results of this study seem to suggest that the keys to promoting mental toughness do not lie in this autocratic, authoritarian, or oppressive style. It appears to lie paradoxically with the coach's ability to produce an environment which emphasizes trust and inclusion, humility, and service. This, I think, Steve, not only applies for a basketball team, but this applies across boundaries when it comes to coaches slash leaders slash bosses, CEOs, you name it. I feel like this is something to really think about of how to take action immediately when building toughness on your team. Curious to hear more about what you think about this. Yeah, I love that quote. When I read it, I was like, oh, this is it. And it essentially says, what does that mean? Be a decent human being, <laughs> right? Like if you're a decent human being who cares about the people you lead, guess what? They're going to be able to handle more difficult things and challenges. They're going to be able to persist longer. And there's research in this in, in the workplace world, right? In Fortune 500 companies where they look at, you know, Google ran a study um, looking at, at, at their productivity and uh, other companies. And they found that the number one factor that led towards like performance gains and all that and in, in their leadership was psychological safety, which was what people felt safe and secure to be who they were and like bring things up that were challenging or difficult and felt like they weren't going to be reprimanded or punished. And I think that is the difference there is if you are leading, you have to create the environment that allows people to thrive if people feel like they are wanted, valued, have a voice, have some choice, can make an impact, they're going to perform better. But somewhere along the way, we've got it like mixed up and confused and thought that like, hey, if we control people, micromanage people, like dictate and demand, this will get them on the right path. You can't force people to get on the right path. You have to create the space and have the conversation so that they can like they feel like they they know what to do and can perform up to their abilities. What why do you think we've gotten off track here? I think it's because it's easier. It's easier as a boss to go in and be like it's my way or the highway. Like this is the way you go. This is what happens. This is this is how you do things. Power is easy. You know, you look at zooming all the way out to a country level. Democracy is hard. Yeah. Being a dictator for the for the person in charge is a lot easier. Doesn't help everybody, but it's a lot easier for the person in charge. With, with that said, there are times when people who are following a leader want to be led. They, I, I felt this as a quarterback. They liked and wanted me at times just to tell them what to do, to take control, to own the huddle, right? To find my voice, to be demonstrative. These were things I was coached and I think led us to doing well. And I think this happens in business too, where at times 
it's like, hey, man, you're the leader. Like, let's go. Let's be decisive. Let's go. So how do you juxtapose between those two of of this? We don't want to be these dictators, obviously. We don't want that. But we also don't want every single meeting for the leader to say, well, I'm not sure. What do we think? And then go around the room for five hours without making a call. What do you think? Like, how do you find the happy medium there? Yeah. So I think here is there's some wonderful research in the uh, psychology of parenting that gives us the answer. And what they found, and this is decades in the work, but what they found is that parents who have high demandingness, meaning they have that, what you're talking about, like those high expectations that I'm going to stand up when and lead when I need to, mm-hmm. when they only have demandingness, it, it leads to bad outcomes. Their, their kids don't behave. They have worse discipline. They're, they're kind of monsters. Okay. But when they couple that high demandingness with what's called high responsiveness, that's where the gold happens, right? So it's not being a pushover. It's not not having high expectations or making decisions. It's coupling that with this high level of responsiveness, which is essentially, you know, do you care about the person? Do they know that you have their best interests at heart? Because you know this as an athlete. If the quarterback comes in the huddle and says, hey, this is what we're going to do and this is the play, you don't be like, oh, I think we need to do this. You go, no, this guy, this guy has shown he wants to win. Like he wants to lead our team in the right direction. That's the play. I'm all for it. Like, let's go. We're all on the same team. That's what it's about. You know, if that quarterback, if you didn't trust them that they actually wanted to like help everybody else on the team win, then you, you wouldn't follow through. But because you know you're on the same page with the same incentives, with the same desires, and that that quarterback or that leader like cares about you, then you're going to get on board. And that's what, it, it, that's what leading is. There's this awesome video. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes at learningleader.com of a guy named Lucas Patrick. I doubt many people had heard of this guy prior to this video. I don't know if you've seen this one. He's an all-of-its alignment for the Green Bay Packers. And it, there was something I think caught uh, a, ca- a camera caught uh, Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback, kind of laying into the guy on the sidelines and really, you know, getting into him. Uh, I mean, he probably made a mistake or something. And they said, like, "How do you handle that, man? How do you deal with this?" And I don't know if the the, the media understood what they were about to to get. And this this the brilliance of Lucas Patrick. What a thoughtful guy. He says, "You know what, guys? What I wish you got to see is." The, the fact that I believe that everyone has this emotional bank account and Aaron makes deposits in this emotional bank account of mine every single day. He's depositing into the love and the care and his, yes, he's high, has high expectations. He's the MVP, right? But he loves on us and cares about us every single day. So yeah, every once in a while when I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I get ripped. And he gets on me. But you guys don't get to see that my emotional bank account is full. And every once in a while, he makes it, he, he does make a withdrawal. And that's what good leaders do. And I thought, like, that's the thing, man. Like, that's what leaders – it doesn't have to be football or any sport. That's what bosses, that's what leaders can do is if you're regularly making deposits into the emotional bank accounts of the people that you're leading, yes, every, I think then you can – be demanding at times and have high expectations and be decisive and do things. And I think that's a great example of what you're talking about because a parent, exact same thing. Yeah, man, I love that. I haven't seen that video, also, but I'm going to go also, watch also, it after this because yeah. that that is that is it. I think so too often we get stuck in like these either or extremes, but it's are you doing the work on the regular basis to fill this person up? And if you do, then it gives you the leeway when it's necessary and required or might be helpful. You know, I was talking to a, um, uh, an NBA coach was, you know, had a phenomenal career and he essentially told me, he said, Steve, I can't mother F them all the time. <laughs> I've got to build them up. And then every once in a while I might throw that in there at the right time, because I know like, Hey, this is what, needs to like snap this guy out 
or this guy needs like this to get him back on track to be like, Hey, wait a minute. My coach just like, he doesn't normally do this. Like this must mean this is really important. And I think, I think that's what it's, that's what it's about. It's not, it's not necessarily like, Hey, never be hard on your, the people you're, you're leading or your employees. It's like, no, you have to be very intentional and deliberate on when you're doing that and build them up around that. So you have that trust and that belonging and that security so that you can push that button when you need to. Steve, I got to ask questions about confidence. Sometimes they ask me about mine, how I've developed it, or, or even more importantly, they ask, honestly, man, I, I lack confidence at times, or I want to build it up, or I want to help build it up with the members of my team. Maybe they lack experience or whatever. And you write about this and you say that confidence Neat. By the way, I've pulled stuff you've written from all over the place. Your books, the most recent book, Tweet Threads, what, which you're an amazing Twitter follow for any of those. I mean, I learned so much just from your Twitter feed alone. So anyway, but that's I think I might have pulled this from that. Confidence needs evidence. Acting with bravado we hadn't, haven't earned only works on easy things. It backfires on anything truly challenging. Doing difficult things, even if you don't quite succeed at them, is how you develop real confidence. You share more about the development of confidence in yourself as well as helping other people develop confidence in themselves. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think this is, again, one of those things we often misunderstand. We think confidence is this thing where we just kind of prop ourselves off and we say, hey, just be confident, act confident, like fake it till you make it. Ugh, but I hate, I, hate, <laughs> yeah. I hate that phrase, man. But the reality is like that, that does work. But as I said, on very simple things, yeah. if I need to stand up in front of my team, maybe, and I'm nervous, sure, I can fake it because I see them every day, you know, if I'm a coach, right? It's not that difficult, whatever. But when it comes to actual like doing difficult things, confidence has to be earned, right? We have to give our brain essentially the evidence because confidence is about your brain not knowing that, hey, I'm going to succeed, but knowing that I've put in the work, I have the capacity to try this thing, okay? If your brain kind of realizes and your mind realizes, I can try this thing, this isn't so far out of my wheelhouse or comfort zone, then it doesn't sound the alarm. Because all confidence is, is not sounding the alarm to, you know, make you freak out or panic or what have you. Confidence is about, you know, keeping your mind under control so that you can, you know, use the tools or strategies or tactics or whatever to perform up to your ability. So for me, it's about have you put in the work? Have you challenged yourself and tried difficult things so that, you know, you, you can, your body is adapted to it. You know, when I was, I was younger, I was very much an introvert who hated speaking in public and doing, you know, big speeches and all that stuff. And how I initially got over that when I got into coaching and then writing and doing all this stuff is pretty simple. I remembered back to my athletic days and I said, you know what? Like you've competed on national TV. You've competed in front of, you know, tens of thousands of people. This is very similar. Like take the same approach. It doesn't mean that the nerves and anxiety are going to go away, but you're giving yourself that evidence that, Hey, I've been in similar situations. Not, I'm not always going to succeed and it's okay if I fail, but it's going to fill that bucket up where I have more experiences and more to draw on whenever I get into something that might push my limits. I remember talking with Jay Hennessy, 26 year Navy SEAL. And Jay told me you have to regularly push your edges and just make that a normal part of who you are so that each time you do it, as you said, Steve, you're, you're a world-class runner, like you're a world-class racer. You've done it all over the place and, and, and have actually done extremely well at it. You can draw 
from putting your toe to the line and saying, I'm, I, I, I can do this. I can push past this. And I think that's why it's having this mindset of always being willing to push my edges so that when I do come up against something that, Ooh, I don't know, I'm a little uncertain, I'm not sure, your brain has the evidence from past performances that, oh, I've done this. Not maybe this exact thing, but I've done this type of thing where I'm pushing my edges regularly. And I think that is super helpful when it comes to being confident with almost anything that you're willing to to, to try or willing to do. Yeah. You know, I love that. Jay is such a, a, a great thinker. Um, and I think he's spot on. And I, I think about this in my life now as someone who you know, just runs to stay in shape and whatever have you, it would be easy to just sit in comfort and not push those edges. But if I don't, it's just like a muscle, it atrophies, right? Mm -hmm. It's still there, but you forget a little bit. And in exercise, this is very easy to see, right? If you've been injured and you haven't worked out in a while, let's say you've been injured and you've been out for a couple months and you start that first hard workout back, it's horrible. And your brain screams at you to stop at the slightest hint of fatigue, right? And that's how I think about other things in life is if you don't push those edges for a while, that sensitivity drops and drops, you know, where now your brain's going to scream at you for things that aren't really that difficult yeah. and aren't really pushing those boundaries, but because you haven't done it in a while, like it's just not used to it. So I think this is for everybody, athletes, executives, leaders, managers, whoever is have something in your life. It can be physical. It can be intellectual, it can be emotional that pushes that edge that puts you in a place where you're a little bit uncomfortable and have to sit with and deal with it. I want to talk about mentors now. We're going to bring it full circle. I mentioned it earlier on. This is something you've written about that. And again, it's another very common question. How do I get good mentors to help me? I know they're important. I've learned that part of it, but how do I how do I get the good ones? And I'm going to I'm going to remind you of a few things that you've said about mentors and then we can expand upon them. I don't expect you to remember everything you've ever published, but I cuz mainly cuz I I I agree with this, especially some more than others. The question posed is how do you find, we know they're important. Okay. That's, yeah. that's, that's assumed next. How do we find a great mentor? A few things that you've written and said that I agree with do interesting things. Now I want to highlight one phrase of that. The word do take action, actually do stuff, do things. So one, do interesting things Two, be open to learning and guidance. Three, be motivated, driven, and curious Yes, about something. Four, as you said before, put your ego aside. Five, do good quality work. And then you write, notice, I didn't say manipulate, harass, bother, or scheme your way into finding somebody. Can you share more about, one, the value of mentors, and then even maybe more importantly, how you go about finding great mentors? I think mentors are one of the most important things you have because what you're doing essentially is it's like, it's almost like a cheat to excellence <laughs> because you're taking someone and their life experience of 30, 40, 50, 60 plus years, whatever it is. And they're passing that along to you through a filter of knowing, like they're taking all the good bits and like filtering it to you on what actually works. So you don't have to spend 40 years doing it. It's the best, you know, quote unquote hack we have. But I think we often go about finding those mentors in the wrong way. As you said there, I think often we think, okay, now I need to go find them. And then we almost, almost like manipulate the situation of like, how do I get involved in this person's inner circle? Or how do I make them think that I'm, I'm, you know, worthy of being mentored. And what I've, I've found in every mentor that I've had and every person that I've mentored myself, it didn't come about by me like seeking out and searching. It came about by me doing which is when I did in interesting things, when I was driven and curious and open to learning, 
like people who were really good mentors took notice of it because they know they, they see things, they sit there and be like, oh man, this person is like me when they were younger. Like they were, they were curious and trying to figure it out. I'm going to pass along this guidance. And in and, and that to me is like the perfect mentor is someone who sees things and says, Hey, this person is curious and driven and all of these things. Like I'm going to pass this information along. So my advice to people is, is pretty simple is do interesting things in whatever field that is, right? Start exploring, start being curious and put it out there, right? Write, write about it, podcast about it, talk about it, share about it with your colleagues. I think far too often where we get in our way here is we think we have the secret sauce. So we get it. We like take our ideas, our interests and keep them protected because we don't want people to like, Oh, you know, this is my idea. I don't want someone else stealing it or what have you. The reality is every single light, there's very little new out there. Every single idea is kind of like borrowed and improved upon. So if you put it out there, your chances of someone who has some insight or like understanding of that goes up dramatically. So do interesting things and then put it out into the world. Um, Okay. I want to speak about something that I think I don't know if it's controversial. It shouldn't be, I don't think, but maybe it is, is that maybe because of the world we live in today that it seems like it it is. The problem with creating an enemy, and you write, whenever an organization, group, or individual works hard to create an enemy to pit their idea slash group against, it's a sign you probably should not Listen, us versus them is the easiest way to exploit human nature, to get people on your side. It often means there's no substance there. And as I said a little bit earlier to you, I think when you're out there and you meet a lot of fascinating people and you read a bunch of books, you become so much more nuanced and so much more reasonable and so much more open to the fact that we're all just trying to figure things out as we go and the world is so messy and gray that this kind of pick a side it just does not work for me at all man like it never does and if someone forces that I am going to be immediately attracted to go the other way regardless of whatever they're for if they have to have an enemy and fight I, I, I struggle with this one so Um, but on the same token in, let's say the sales world where I used to work, you would sometimes create the chief competitor as like, they're the bad guys. They're the enemy. And it's like us versus them as like the rallying, rallying cry. Now as I was like, well, you know, I seem to do well when I focus on making more sales calls, you know, like (laughs) I don't really, it doesn't really matter about what the competitor's doing. It's, I've, I've noticed that when I stick true to my process, things seem to go better and I win the awards and get to go on the trips and stuff. So can you share more about this kind of the lack of substance with a leader or with a group when they need to, or when they work really hard to create an enemy to pit their idea or group against? Yeah. You know, I, I think this is like, it's a human problem. As I said, as you said there, it's human nature. We, it's our tribal instinct to define who's in our group and who's in the out group. Right. So we create these us as us versus them. And I think the danger of that in a workplace or leading standpoint is that that's very easy to do. As I said, it's human nature to fall on that on that track. But what you're doing there is you're essentially kind of manipulating people to try and manipulate their motivation. Because if you create an enemy, what it does is if there's someone else out there that we hate, that we don't like, what it does is it 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 kind of makes that group of your in-group coalesce. Mm-hmm. So it's like the cheat, the cheat way to create cohesion. But the problem is, in order to create that cohesion, you have to keep expanding and blowing up that enemy on the outside, and you almost have to like demonize them and create them as an other 
And over the long haul, that's not A, healthy, and not B, sustainable. So I think far better than creating this like us versus them is creating just what you said in the sales, you know, your sales experiences. How do we create this internal drive? How do we create this trust and community and belonging that is based on what we do and not a fear of someone else? So whenever someone starts to paint the other side or another idea or what have you as someone evil or an enemy or as an other, my antenna always goes up because I'm, I, I sit there and I'm like, oh, this person's trying to essentially manipulate me. They're trying to get me super angry and outraged at like experience outrage against someone else. So that then they can like control my kind of decision making and my kind of sense of community and belonging. So I, I see it as a warning sign. If someone's telling me to hate someone else or hate another side, I I look the other way because that that's a sign that I need to be aware. What do you think about rivals, whether it's a team, company? You know, the I live in Ohio, so the Ohio State, Michigan, like people like cross out M's and stuff. I think it's kind of dumb, but I get it. Uh, but like this, these, this whole thing of that, and they have the countdown clock to that game every year. W- what do you think about rivals and that being a motivation to like one extra rep in the gym or whatever it may be? Yeah, you know, there's there's some interesting research on rivalries, and I don't know it all that well, but what I do know is this: is that Um, it's twofold. Rivalries can increase motivation, but we also tend to choke in sport at a higher level when we're facing a rival. Hmm. So it kind of pushes us to both extremes, right? Is yes, sometimes it can like up your game, but sometimes it can create this pressure expectation that puts you in a place where your game just falls apart. So to me, when it comes to rivalries is in things that, you know, I'll say don't really matter in the grand scheme of things like, a you know, in sport, what have you like, yes, it matters. I love sport, all that stuff, but I don't think it's like too harmful because everybody hopefully can step back and be like, Hey, it's sport. You know, if you can't, that's the problem. If you really truly, you know, won't talk to someone from Michigan, if you're at, at Ohio state, that's a problem. If you really just don't like, you know, Michigan because they're your rival, whatever on the, on the football field, doesn't matter. That's fine. So I think we have to be very careful on where we're looking at rivals. And the other thing that I know the research shows as well is that often the better thing to do is to look at your competitors as again, not evil, And not as like, hey, they're my best friends, what have you. But look at people who give you the opportunity to raise your game. Yep. Yep. So it it, and I'll use my sport here in running. I look at it as, you know, I might have someone who's faster, but they give me the opportunity to be able to see if I'm able to hang with them. Right. Yeah. So it, it forces me to see if I can, I, can, I can improve my own performance. And I think when you, you frame things as that instead of, you know, oh, I hope they fall or perform poorly, that's not a productive rivalry, right? You want them to be able to push you to improve your own performance and raise your own game. The interview Draymond Green after the, the Warriors beat, um, Jokic's team Jokic is an MVP of the league I think he probably will two time and they 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 said what did you say to him after the game we saw you talking to him and he said I I said thank you you're 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 such a great player you force me to 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 perform at a higher level in order to to do well and so I truly am and you could tell he was genuine he genuinely was grateful and he and he wanted to tell them that I thought that's awesome like that's what it's all about like that's that's when some of this comparison competition can be for good when you are there like I need to raise the level of my play in order to, for us to do well to help my team. Uh, Steve, I want to shift gears a little bit because 
much like your collaborative partner, Brad Stolberg, who I love Brad and his work, and you guys have written books together, which I'm fascinated about the kind of the co-writing process, and maybe we'll get to it here if we have a second. Um, but you you spend a lot of time coaching people one-on-one, -on -one, correct? Correct. So not just runners, but like high-performing leaders, CEOs, and all of that. What is, and this may be more for me than anybody because it's some of the work that I do and, and I'm always looking to continually get better at it. And I think it has gotten better over the past four years. Um, I hope, I think the clients would say that. What, what, what's your process to start working with a high performing leader and helping that person get better? Like your overall philosophy, the way you go about it. Yeah. You know, this is, it's, it's been fun getting into this journey of, of, again, my background is in sports. So that's where I started, but over the last four or five years have branched out into executives and leaders and entrepreneurs and, and physicians and all that good stuff. And it's fun. And I think my process is, my process is pretty simple is I, it, it starts with the conversation. So the first session that we have actually it's not even an official session with anybody. I say, hey, before we work together, I want to spend an hour with you and we're just going to talk. Yeah. I want to get to know you, understand what you're struggling with, understand your story. And then at the end, we're both going to decide, hey, does this sound like a good fit or not? Because I think the most important thing is that people feel comfortable working with me and I feel comfortable working with them. Now it doesn't, you know, it's rare, but it happens every once in a while where you're like, ah, I don't know if I'm the right fit for you. And you have to have like the humility and ego and like, you know, put it aside and be like, you know what? I can't, I can't help everybody. Like someone else might be better for you. And I think that's where it starts. That's my philosophy is like, put the ego aside. My job is to help someone. Am I capable of doing this? Am I the best person for this? And then let's have a conversation and understand that person as a human being before we get into, okay, you know, I need help in X, Y, and Z. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating world that I never expected to be in, but I, I find it to be hugely rewarding when you actually see progress being made because of your ability to listen and to be curious and to offer little pieces of advice here and there as you go. My friend Sam Coffin, who we've been working together for a few years now, and Sam's an amazing leader in his own right. He's like, you're my lifting partner, man. You're my lifting partner. That's it. like we both are doing, we're both getting after it but we're, we're lifting partners. I'm like, that's the perfect analogy for how I'd say we approach these things where we're both working hard. We're both getting after it. We're both spotting each other. We're helping each other. And that relationship is, is, can be, can be really powerful. Speaking of a partner, you work with Brad Stolberg. Um, first, what's it like with these two really thoughtful, smart guys writing books together? Like I initially said, books are too personal. There's no way I would ever write with somebody else. I've, change my mind on that. I think I could see a person if I had a deep respect for their thought process and the way that they kind of behave and certainly their, their writing capabilities, I could see that being something I would do now. What's it like for you and Brad being, and I know this, this most recent book, do hard things you wrote by yourself, but for, for some of your previous books you've written with him, what's that like? Yeah, it's wonderful, you know, and honestly, I was uh, the same hesitations at first where I was like, oh, I don't know a book like you want it to be your voice and like you want you're very particular about it, but it's wonderful. And and the reason I'd say that even even on do hard things and Brad's book on the practice of groundedness, like we would have conversations on the book and what's included and all that stuff, even though we were writing them separately. And I think what makes it work again is some of the themes that we've talked about throughout this conversation is putting your ego aside, humility, like trust and openness. And if you have those things, then you can have the conversations and wrestle with the topics and ideas. And the way we work together is at first, it is just a ton and ton of conversation 
where we're just saying, hey, what about this idea? What do you think about this? And the other part of it that is very important here is that we recognize and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. So Brad is very meticulous, like grammar loves it. Very meticulous. I am very like big picture. Like, let's think this through. How does this apply? Like, I want to get to the action step. How does this make, you know, get people better? You know, Brad is very, loves to read like ancient wisdom and all that stuff. And I like that too, but I love the science. Yeah. So I'm going to be research citations in your most recent book it's like the whole thing is packed with it which i personally uh, appreciate yes yeah, yeah. so that's that's what i like yeah. so we we balance that out you know we have we bring those different things to the the, the forefront on our writing and i think that it, that is the key and the other thing that i'd say as well is that figure out how you're going to get through difficult spots where you disagree so whenever, whenever we were writing together and we'd have a section where I'd be like, you know what? I don't know about this. And Brad would be like, you know what? I really love it. Um, we had a process, which was pretty simple. I said, if you're in love with it and this is a must have, if someone says that we keep it regardless of the other person, if it's a like and a kind of dislike, then what we do is we punt. We'd have these other people who would say, hey, read this section. Tell us what you think. Is it worth it or not? And then whatever they said, we'd, we'd just go with it. So I think having some sort of process to like resolve disagreements is, is important as well because they're going to happen. Hmm. Would you guys divide chapters and then just go and then, and then you pass all? I know Brian Koppelman and David Levine, they're the writers of the TV show Billions. I talked to Brian a lot about this. And, you go, and that's how they, they basically divide. And then they would pass it to each other and edit each other's work and then back and forth. And they're just continually passing the drafts back and forth. But somebody would usually own it and then they would just keep passing them. Is that how you guys do it? Or how, what's like practically or, or when we're getting down to the actual tactics, now, how do you guys do it? Yeah. So how we do it is the broad outline we would outline together. Okay. Right. So for chapters and what we're going to cover, the basic, you know, 30,000 foot view. We'd outline that together in person. Um, once we had that, then we would flip back and forth. Okay. So <clears throat> one person would be, you know, working on a chapter, writing it, right? And then writing one chapter and then outlining another. And the other person would like flip and be outlining one, the other chapter and like writing and we'd flip back and forth. Right. Wow. So it was like, it, it, it was like, you know, to make it concrete, um, I might outline chapter one and then pass that on, on, on to Brad to write. Well, he was outlining chapter two and then. I'd start writing chapter two while he was writing chapter one. So we'd, that way we, we almost both had like our feel on it. We had either written or outlined the chapter, you know? And then once we got done with like those chapters, we'd flip so that we'd edit whatever the person writing. So that way it was like every single piece of the book had like our own kind of personal um, you know, stamp yep. on it, whether it was in the words written, the editing or the outlining, it was all part of, you know, each of our voices. What does one of your outlines look like? It's, it's pretty deep. Could so, you send one to me? Could I see it? Can I see? One? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I can send it because essentially okay. what it is, is it's, it's again, the broad outline is we know what the topic is. Yeah. So it's the big topics for each chapter. Okay. And then the deep outline is here are the potential stories we can tell. Here are the potential science that confirms or validates this. And then the person writing, what they wow. do is they take, they look and they say, oh, let's try this story. Let's validate with this science. Let's leave this story alone. And you essentially give the person crafting and writing, like the, the ability to kind of shape things and the options to do, do so. Love it. I think 
the method of whether it's keynote speaking from a stage or writing a book, story, science, practical application, right? So what? Why should I care as the reader, as the person in the seats? Why should I care? Those three, if you hit those and you got a good, it's a formula that I found seems to work well. I don't always get it right, mess it up. Obviously, we all do. But but I fa- found that that seems to be a good method for thinking about how to get across a point that could drive action, right? Make you think, but then actually hopefully drive you to do something that changes your life for the better. I think doing that and thinking of it that way can be so useful as you're like looking at the blank page or you're, you're, you're starting your outline. I think that part of it helps me get started. Yeah, I love it. I think I think you're spot on. I think that story science and that practical application is, or the, the so what yep. is, is is how I think about organizing all all my books, all my writing, all my speaking, and um, it's it's very effective. One more question, Steve. Uh, let's say somebody's a bit earlier in their career, right? We talked about how some of these people earlier in their career are way miles ahead of where I was certainly at that age. But what are some general pieces of life slash career advice you give to somebody who maybe has graduated college within the past couple of years? Uh. Patience. So it's very, it's very tempting to again just want to be like, oh, I want to take over and conquer the world. Um, but life unfolds how it's gonna unfold. We like to try and force things, but the reality is like it's gonna unfold and and there's so many unpredictable paths. The other thing that I like to tell young people is diversify your skill set, diversify your sources of meaning. Hmm. Because so often we we kind of think this is my path. This is how I'm going to get locked in. This is what I'm going to do for the future. But as I reflect on my career, and I'm sure you're the same way, there are so many different twists and turns that if you look back and you talk to, I don't know, 22 year old Steve, he'd be like, what are you talking about? You're going to be doing this. You're going to be talking to these people. You're going to be coaching like, you know, executives. That's what you want to do. And, you know, 22 year old Steve would be like, nah, no way. But because like I was open right along that path and like saw different twists and turns and like had that, that awareness and that ability to kind of say, okay, you know, like let's dabble in this. Let's explore it. If it doesn't work out, that's okay. So give yourself that freedom. Don't get locked in. So true. So good, man. And I think being really focused on being excellent at your current job, your current piece of work, uh, Steve Martin would say, be so good they can't ignore you. He wasn't focused on an agent or publicity. He was focused on being great at telling funny jokes on stage. And then as you said earlier, 10 years later, he was an overnight sensation, right? From the from the year one of going to open mics with a bartender and a, a person from the wait staff watching him flail around on stage trying to get five minutes to ten years later selling out arenas. Uh, it's it's a focus on being so good they can't ignore you. It's really good, Steve. This is awesome, man. It flew by. The book that I highly recommend is called do hard things why we get resilience wrong and the surprising science of real toughness i would say we covered like six percent of the book during this conversation and it was absolutely packed so there's a lot more in my outline for this conversation that we didn't get to that's why i think people should should get the book it's it's super helpful and steve i i just want to acknowledge uh how much you've helped me without even realizing it i've followed your works for a long time now and i'm just really grateful that we got the opportunity to talk and i certainly would love to continue our dialogue as we both progress man Ryan, thanks so much. I love this conversation and I love the work that you're doing. I mean, bringing these conversations to light. I mean, this is this is energizing. This is what it's about. I'm going to walk away from this and have to write some notes down on on things that you said and and try and keep improving and up my game. Love it, man. Thanks so much.